So yeah, thanks again, Matt, and hi, everyone. I'm Luis, and I'm, I work in the Electrical Energy Systems Research Group at Imperial College. And today I'll be talking about low inertia grids. So I will give a brief overview of what the operational challenges are, and also some methods that we have developed to deal with these challenges. So let's start. Uh, we are going to see lower inertia on the road to lower emissions. And this is going to be a problem, particularly in an island like Great Britain, because lower inertia will come from replacing synchronous generators like coal and gas fire power plants by non-synchronous renewables like wind turbines and solar PV panels. The key idea is that the synchronous generators have a rotating mass that induces currents into the grid by creating a rotating magnetic field. And this is the inertia. The inertia stores kinetic energy as it rotates to produce the power that we consume. And the inertia is a very valuable energy buffer that naturally helps stabilize the grid. But most renewables do not naturally provide inertia. And it is very clear with a solar PV panel, like the, the one you see in the picture, where there is no rotating mass at all. In wind turbines, there is a rotating mass, but it is decoupled from the grid through a power electronics converter. So it does not naturally provide this energy buffer. And let me tell you just a bit about frequency, because frequency is a very important magnitude in low energy power systems. This is because for when, for whatever reason, there is an outage of a large, large generator in the grid that causes a sudden imbalance between generation and demand. And as I will show in a moment, this would decrease the electric frequency in the grid. Devices could be damaged if frequency dropped too low. So the regulation in Great Britain states that it must be above 49.2 Hertz at all times, because if it dropped below this value, some protection devices in the grid would start to disconnect loads and potentially we could even reach a, a full blackout. So we have to keep frequency within safe limits to maintain the stability of the system. And I think it's important to better understand why frequency is uh, key in low inertia grids. So let's see in a bit more detail how this magnitude changes during transients in the grid. And just let me start by giving some basics of a power system. Power is typically produced by synchronous generators, which have these big rotating masses and these set the frequency of the grid. And if there is a mismatch between generation and demand, because we have lost some generator, these rotating masses spontaneously release the kinetic energy that they have stored so that the system is always in balance. By releasing this kinetic energy, that means that the rotating mass starts to slow down. So then the electric frequency in the grid decreases because electric frequency is determined by the rotating speed of the generators. And in a typical power system, there are control devices that detect the decrease in rotational speed. So these controls would then increase the mechanical power of the generators so that we all go back to nominal, nominal speed. And finally, the original power balance is restored and frequency goes back to the nominal 50 Hertz. Okay, so what I have just explained happens constantly in a power system because there are power imbalances all the time. For example, if you turn on your light at home, there's a tiny power imbalance that causes frequency to fluctuate, as you see in those small oscillations around the 50 hertz in, in the graph. And to correct these minor changes in frequency, some generator, maybe somewhere in, in Wales, for example, would slightly increase its power output to compensate for your living room light, which is now on. But summarizing the main idea is that changes in the electric frequency are driven by power imbalances in the grid. So with less inertia due to renewables, frequency becomes more volatile. But minor power imbalances are not a big concern. But what if there is a large sun imbalance because there is a generator outage? Let's see what would happen using the graph that you see in the slide. So frequency would drop rapidly. And if there is less inertia, it would drop faster. And what hopefully you have seen is that the green bar for generation has increased. And that's because some kinetic energy stored in the rotating masses of synchronous generators has been released to the grid. And then the control devices of generators act, forcing them to increase their power output. And this power injection is called frequency response. So the green bar for generation has increased again thanks to frequency response. But at the same time, we have seen that the red bar for demand has decreased a bit. And that is because some loads are frequency responsive. So when frequency drops, they decrease their power consumption. And after the power contributions from inertia, from frequency response and from load damping, we reach a power equilibrium. But this is a new equilibrium. 
It's not the same one as before default. Therefore, the frequency stays at some quasi steady state, which is some value slightly below the nominal 50 Hertz. And later on, slower power injections from generators will bring frequency back to, to the 50 Hertz, the original 50 Hertz. And the main message from all of this is that the frequency drop that you see in the slide is going to happen much faster as inertia keeps decreasing. Because inertia essentially gave us some valuable time, several seconds to contain this frequency drop. But today and even more in the future, we have to deal with this drop in frequency in just a few seconds. And here you can see a diagram with the frequency containment services in Great Britain. So first we have the inertia, which makes its highest contribution to supporting frequency at the very moment of the generation loss, which is when the rate of change of frequency is maximum. Then comes enhanced frequency response or EFR in the diagram, which is a fast power injection, mainly coming from batteries. And this happens, this, this power injection happens within one second after the outage. And to clarify for people who are familiar with ancillary services in Great Britain, we now have a very similar service to EFR, which is called dynamic containment by National Grid. Then we have the traditional primary frequency response, which is PFR in the diagram. This is a, slow, a slower power injection from synchronous generators, which have true control. And it takes around 10 seconds to be fully delivered due to the mechanical elements in generators, which just cannot be as fast as batteries. And finally, we have secondary frequency response or SFR, which makes the frequency go back to the nominal 50 Hertz. But the focus of my work and the talk today are the services supporting the first few seconds after a fault, as that is the period that is mostly affected by the reduction in inertia. And now let me just show you an example of what can happen if there aren't enough ancillary services, because we actually experienced it in Great Britain in August 2019 when more than 1 million customers lost power and there was quite a lot of disruption to rail services in the Friday evening commute. And that was in the newspapers, as you can see in the picture. So this incident in 2019 was caused by a lightning strike in the grid, which forced two large plants to trip, a gas plant and, and an offshore wind farm. And there were not enough ancillary services to secure this large outage. So frequency started to drop and eventually some load was disconnected. And this graph explains why there was no disconnection. I've taken it from National Grid's report on, on the 2019 incident, and it includes a very detailed description of every event that happened during the incident. But the key here is that frequency dropped below the acceptable threshold. So load was shed to contain the generation demand imbalance. And just another real life example of the challenge of operating low inertia grids happened during the first lockdown in 2020 in GB which was due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And the cost of ancillary services related to inertia was of roughly 300 million pounds during May to July 2020, which is three times more than in the same period in the previous year. And to understand this, to understand the challenge and the increasing cost, we need to consider three main factors of the lockdown period. First, the depressed electricity demand. As people started working from home and economic activity was quite significantly reduced. Second, that during this period, there was typical power output from renewables, in spite of the low electricity prices that we saw due to low demand. And that happened because most renewables are shielded from low electricity prices due to their zero fuel costs. And third, during this period, there was also a typical power output from nuclear plants. These plants are also not significantly affected by market prices due to their inflexibility and also low short-run marginal cost. And the consequence of these three factors was that we had two major sources of power during lockdown, which were renewables and nuclear. But currently, we cannot operate the GB grid with just uh, nuclear and renewables, so, because system stability would have been compromised due to low inertia. So gas plants had to be turned on by the system operator to increase inertia, which is why the cost of ancillary services increased quite significantly during this period. Okay, but does this actually tell us about um, the future situation, the challenge, for example, that we saw during COVID? Will we see anything like that in the future? Well, what we know is that we expect uh, some future trends. Mainly, we, we expect an increase in load on the road to decarbonization through the electrification of heat and transport. But we also expect an even higher rate of increase in renewable capacity. 
And also for the, great, the case of Great Britain, we will see an increase in the largest possible loss due to commissioning of a large nuclear plant. So the consequence is that we will see low net demand in the future system. That is demand that must be covered by dispatchable generators. So in fact, the future decarbonized system could experience similar challenges as the ones we saw during, during the COVID lockdown. And now I'll talk a bit about the research that I've done in this area. I think this slide summarizes quite well my main line of work, which basically tries to answer the question, how can we optimally procure the ancillary services that we need to tackle this low inertia problem? So to tackle this question, we need to integrate the differential equations that describe the ancillary services into an economic optimization, which is formulated with algebraic equations. And another way of seeing this challenge is that we must map the sub-second time scale of a frequency drop into a bigger time scale of minute or hours, like a typical wholesale electricity market clearing. At the same time, uh, the differential equations have a spatial component because of the different frequencies across the network, as I will show later on. And our work in this area in the past couple of years has led to the development of the Ancillary Services Constraint Energy Scheduling Model, or ACES model for short. And this is quite a unique modeling tool. And it allows us to project the future need for ancillary services under different generation mixes. The ancillary services dynamics are mapped into the optimization through the Rokoff and Nadir constraints, which enforce the limits that must be respected to avoid demand disconnection. So this ACES model is essentially a frequency secured stochastic unit commitment, because it also accounts for the uncertainty in renewable generation up to 24 hours into the future. The objective function of the optimization is to minimize the expected value of system operating costs, which are essentially fuel costs and startup costs, with the goal of meeting demand at all times. And we use a scenario tree that considers a range of possible realizations of the renewable output. And the operating cost for each node in the tree is weighted by the probability of reaching that node. So finally, the total expected cost is minimized. Okay, so the frequency stability constraints integrated into the ACS model are obtained from the swing equation. And this swing equation is a reduced model that represents the aggregated frequency dynamics of an electricity grid, which is basically the blue curve that you see in the figure represented mathematically. And by solving this swing equation, we can obtain the conditions for guaranteeing that the Rokoff will not exceed a certain value and that the frequency in there will not drop below the acceptable limit. So the volume of the different ancillary services that help to contain a frequency drop are co-optimized in the Rogoff and Nadir constraints. These services are the inertia, EFR, PFR, and also the size of the largest loss. So the unit commitment solution guarantees that there are enough uh, resources like inertia, so that if there was a sudden generation loss, the system would still maintain stability. And to give you just a bit more mathematical detail, we want the optimization problem to be convex. Typically, not only because solving non-convex problems to global optimality is in most cases impossible, but also because formulating the operation of an electricity system as a convex problem has quite nice properties, such as, for example, obtaining shadow prices for electricity. And the formulation that you see in this slide is indeed convex. So we have actually done some work on obtaining prices for ancillary services. And those of you who are familiar with optimization might realize that the another constraint here in the slide it's actually non-linear because we have multiplications of the seizure variables and we also have a square term. But in fact, this is a second order cone. So it is non-linear, but it's still convex. So the formulation of the ACES model that you are seeing can be solved with a mixed in figure second order cone solver. And today there are several solvers that provide quite good performance for these problems, including open source software, but also the major com commercial solvers. And here are some results from, from the ACES model. We can see that the inertia, that inertia used to be a byproduct of energy because it was naturally provided by thermal generators, as you can see in the distribution for system inertia in 2016. But it is becoming an insurance because we have to pay for it independent of energy and we need it to absorb faults that might happen in the system. In the blue distribution, which is this projection for 2030 generated by our model, 
the low values of inertia mean that thermal plants are committed at times when they are not really needed for energy, but they are needed to guarantee stability. And by running ACs, we can also obtain the projected operating cost of the future electricity system. Here you can see the results for considering national grids leading the way future energy scenario, which expects uh, in 2020 expected a carbon neutral electricity system by 2030. And this system has almost 100%, uh, sorry, 100 gigawatts of renewables and 14 gigawatts of storage. And you can see that there's a clear reduction in total OPEX compared to 2015, but also that the cost for ancillary services increases, and in this case reaches 15% of total OPEX. And now I will talk about an increasing concern in low inertia grids, which are regional variations of frequency across the electricity network. Because so far we have assumed that frequency is roughly equal across the grid, but this assumption is becoming less accurate. We are seeing interior oscillations in grids where inertia is not evenly distributed geographically. And this is the case of Great Britain, where we have high wind capacity in Scotland and therefore low inertia there, but most of the demand is located in England. So ignoring this spatial aspect of frequency could be dangerous because we need to understand where to place ancillary services and so that we can keep the system in balance. Okay, but when is this uniform frequency model inaccurate? Well, by running some time domain simulations, we can see that the critical cases are the combination of non-uniform distribution of inertia across the system and a contingency happening in the low inertia region. And the graphs consider a case with 90% of the inertia in England and 10% in Scotland. The simulation results show a fairly small contingency in, in Scotland. So they were obtained by considering this fairly small contingency in Scotland, which is three times smaller than the contingency in England. But we can see that in that case, the one you see on the right, that small contingency can still cause large initial oscillations that would violate frequency limits in Scotland. Okay, so we know that this can be a problem, but how can we incorporate regional frequency constraints into our scheduling model? Well, first we need a dynamic model for, for the regional frequencies. And we can formulate this by using coupled swing equations. So each region is modeled by a swing equation that is coupled with neighboring regions through a power transfer term. This power transfer term is dependent on the phase angle of the generators in each region and therefore varies when there is a frequency drop since frequency is the derivative of phase angle. Okay, and once we have the regional frequencies model, we aim to obtain frequency stability conditions in each region. But solving this regional frequencies model is very complicated. So to obtain the condition for keeping the nadir above the security limit, we proposed to use a, an energy-based equilibrium, which comes from integrating the swing equation in, in a given region. And all the mathematical details are in, in our paper, but this regional nadir constraint can be easily understood in simple terms. What this condition is telling us is that the energy lost must be lower than the maximum admissible energy injected. This maximum admissible energy injected is limited by the maximum kinetic energy that can be extracted from the rotating masses in synchronous generators. Because if frequency drops below delta F max, the, the, the symbol that you see in the constraint, this delta F max is the limit for the nadir. In this case, it would be 0.8 Hertz, right? So because nominal frequency is 50 Hertz and in the UK, the lowest point should be 49.2 Hertz. So if this delta F max goes beyond 0.8 Hertz, it means that the rotating masses have slowed down too much. That is that more kinetic energy has been extracted had extracted from the synchronous generators than was acceptable. So the energy lost is the one due to the deficit of generation from the, ma the machine that is on outage. And I know that it's not very correct to say that the energy has been lost. What I mean is the energy that we were counting on, but it is no longer there. So it must be compensated by other forms of energy, which are the ones that appear on the right hand side of the constraint. So on this right hand side, we have the maximum energy that can be extracted from inertia, as I explained just now. We also have the contribution from um, energy injected from frequency response. 
the energy injected from load damping, and also the energy injected from other regions in the, in the power system. And in summary, we have some methods in the paper with which we can formulate this as a linear constraint for an optimization problem. And here are some results from including the regional frequency constraints in the ACS model. These results show that the location of inertia is key for keeping the system stable, but the optimal location will also depend on its cost in each region. In this case, we considered a fault of 1.8 gigawatts in England, which is the future Hinkley Point C nuclear plant. So most inertia and response must be located in England if a large generation outage occurs in that region. But we always need some inertia in Scotland too. That is to contain the raw coffee in Scotland. And exactly how much inertia we would schedule in each region depends on the cost. If inertia is twice as expensive in England, we will need to overcompensate by buying more in Scotland, which will result in buying more overall inertia in GB. And that is because the largest possible contingency in GB will be this nuclear plant located in England. So inertia in Scotland is less effective to keep the system stable in this case, because it is, it is far from that contingency. And we have also demonstrated the importance of moving to, an, to a regional N minus one security criterion instead of the system wide N minus one standard. What this means is that going forward, we cannot simply consider the largest overall contingency in the system. We must consider the largest possible contingency in each region. The results that you can see in this slide come from considering a mid-size loss in, in Scotland of uh, 0.8 gigawatts in this case, which is roughly half of the capacity of the HDDC North Sea Link. And since Scotland is the region with the lowest inertia, the spatial frequency scheduling makes sure that some inertia is available in Scotland to secure the frequency drop in that region. Okay, so I'm reaching the end of today's presentation. And today I've presented just a few examples of the learnings that we can get from models that integrate ancillary services requirements into power system schedule. Some applications of these models are the ones that you see in the slide. For example, we can learn how to optimally operate the system by co-optimizing energy and ancillary services. We can also use them to study the value of different technologies, for example, fast power injections from battery storage. We can also use them to understand where in the network to place ancillary services, guaranteeing that regional stability is, um, well, guaranteeing that we maintain regional stability cost effectively. And finally, we can also use them to inform market design for ancillary services by putting in place the right incentives for providers of inertia and frequency response. But what's next in frequency control? Well, some network operators are starting to install synchronous condensers, which are synchronous motors that provide inertia, also reactive power and short circuit current. These are in a sense still old world devices because they are electromechanical assets, just like synchronous generators. But also a very hot topic today is grid forming inverters, which could potentially operate a grid with 100% inverter based resources. Up to now, they have been mostly a research topic with little deployment in real grids, only in isolated systems, such as very small islands. But we are probably going to see widespread deployment very soon. And actually these technologies, for example, eligible for contracts under the stability pathfinder tenders that are being run by national grid. And finally, we might, we, we might start seeing more demand side flexibility support for frequency containment. Some promising technologies for this are electric vehicles and electrolyzers. And we are actually ourselves running some studies to analyze the value of these technologies that we, we hope to share with all of you soon. But an unsolved question going forward is how many and where do we need these technologies? And this is a very complicated problem because it requires advanced modeling of power systems, transients, economic optimization, and also market design. But stay tuned because I'm sure that we will soon see some very interesting advances coming from research groups and, and industry from all over the world. And that's it from me for today. And you can find more details in our papers, which are in open access in, in my website, as well as some code. And also feel free to, to drop me a note if you want to discuss anything in more detail. Okay, thank you.